Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 289, recorded on April 19th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. This week, the Fedora Project announced version 38, with a new-looking website to go along with it. Yeah, it looks pretty sharp. The teams did a great job. It's just slightly outshined by Fedora 38 itself, which is introducing several new spins, including a budgie spin, a sway spin, a posh-based mobile-focused spin. It's all spinny up in Fedora land on version 38. (laughs) Now, of course, GNOME 44 is the headline feature for Fedora Workstation, which includes a new lock screen, that new background apps section of the quick menu, and a range of improvements to the system's settings app much of which we covered in a recent Linux Action News. Yeah, don't call it a SysTray menu. It's background apps. Uh, I'm pleased to see the unfiltered version of FlatHub shipping in Fedora 38. That was surprisingly annoying sometimes on newest systems. And one thing I noticed right away in our testing was the improved shutdown times. In fact, I think it might have been the exact scenario the developers had envisioned. I was running late, needed to run out the door, and I wanted to shut my laptop down and put it in my bag. And... uh, Definitely noticed and appreciated the quick shutdown. Speaking of speed, DNF5 lands in Fedora 38. It's not yet enabled by default, but you can play around with it and test it out before it becomes the default in a future release of Fedora. 38 also ships with Linux 6.2, Mesa 23, and for you Plasma Spin fans, Plasma 527 LTS. That's one of the things you got to love about Fedora. It's, it's always pretty fresh. We also saw new images for ARM64 systems. Really nice to see. And work's going on behind the scenes to enable more Asahi patches in Fedora. We'll have more on that in the future. It's not necessarily overall a barn burner release, as you might say, but there's quite a bit to like in Fedora 38, regardless of the spin you end up using. We've got it up and running right now. We're testing out for a complete review in Linux Unplugged 507. It's coming up this Sunday. So don't miss that. The Rust Foundation surprised everyone when they released a new trademark policy, long in the works, for public comment. And comment they did. Some of them upset, and somewhat understandably too. This first draft is being called an open source train wreck by some. And it does seem like some of these new trademark policies would not only be hard to impossible to enforce, but perhaps even harmful in some cases. Uh, For example, here's a quote. Using the word Rust in the name of a tool for use in the Rust tool chain, a software program written in the Rust language, or a software program compatible with Rust software will most likely require a license, end quote. In other words, you can't put Rust in the name if you've created a Rust-based app or library. Events and conferences are another area in their original language that could be tricky. For example, quote, We will consider requests to use the word Rust within a conference on a case-by-case basis, but at a minimum would expect events and conferences using the word Rust to be non-profit making, focused on discussion of and education on Rust software, prohibit the carrying of firearms, comply with local health regulation, and have a robust code of conduct. Yeah, that does smell a little bit like getting in politics and deciding on s- situational basis what conferences they're going to support and endorse. But this has begun to be walked back. In the first of two blog posts, the team behind this new policy attempted to share some background and, well, they asked for patience. Yeah, here's a bit of that background you mentioned, Chris. Quote, Since the draft was announced, we've noticed a widespread impression that this policy was created solely by the foundation, and is being imposed on the Rust project and community. That is not true. The policy draft was created with the input and consent of each of the co-authors of this post, with the intent to clarify existing policies, incorporate community feedback, and preserve the Rust brand for years to come. Yeah, that post, it read to me like an attempt to explain themselves. Uh, They call out people for getting nasty in the comments, and they kind of leave it at that. They don't talk about a change or signaling that they got the policy a bit wrong or even try to say that maybe they messed the communication up. But that post was then followed up by another blog post on a different Rust blog 
And this newer post takes a more apologetic tone, saying, quote, while we have only just begun the process of carefully reviewing your feedback, we understand that the process of drafting the Rust trademark policy should have been more transparent, and we apologize for that. The consultation phase of the policy drafting process was intended to give the Rust community members the opportunity to review the first draft of the trademark policy and express their questions, concerns, and comments. This process has helped us understand that the initial draft clearly needs improvement. And, well, at this point, it sounds like we'll just have to wait and see what the quote-unquote stakeholders decide. In this final blog post, though, they do wrap it up, seemingly trying to assure us a bit, saying, quote, We want to reiterate that we will not put any policy into effect until we have something that both the Rust Foundation and Rust Project leadership are satisfied with. But wait no longer for more game compatibility. No, no. You'll see real results with Proton 8. At least according to Valve's Pierre-Lou Griffet, who says 8.0 is their, quote, biggest rebase to date. And along with Vulcan 1.3's support, it brings a long list of now playable games. It's a good looking list, too. Uh, we have it linked in the notes, but when I went through it, I was happy to see Dead Space, the 2023 remake on there. I have heard that is a great game. Like, my deck needs that game once it goes on sale. Proton 8 is based on Wine 8.0. It's got a newer DXVK Git snapshot in there and also fixes several annoying issues. Yeah, the range of those fixes is kind of interesting. There are very game-specific fixes, of course, like fixing the uh, the native scroll bar always being visible in Final Fantasy XIV's online launcher. But there's also stuff like system issues. Um, say, resolving a bug that prevented Alt-Tab from working on GNOME 43, which, yeah, that would be annoying. Yeah, it's quite the list. It's very specific game stuff, all the way to like, well, somebody made a change in the graphics stack on Linux, and now we are making a change to fix that. And that's fundamental to making something work. Both Wine and Downstream Proton, they're really impressive. When you look at what they're doing with each release, it is a massive job. So when they got a big one like this, it's even more impressive. Because they have to keep up with every significant game patch or game launcher change. They also have to keep up with each new release of the games that people want to play, substantial graphics API changes, which happen from time to time, Windows API changes, Linux desktop changes, which is happening all the time, all while trying to bring new features in as well. It is quite impressive. The Linux Fest Northwest is back this year in person, October 20th to the 22nd, at the Bellingham Technical College. And the Fest's call for papers is open. And they're looking for experienced technical presenters as well as first-timers to present to a hybrid audience. The Jupiter Broadcasting crew, well, will be there. And we hope to see you there in the fall. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on an account and check it out while you're supporting the show. Linode is fast, reliable cloud hosting with the best support in the business, built to be accessible for a first-timer or somebody who's been racking and stacking for 20 years. And they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers that want to lock you into their crazy lockdown platforms that you can't even log in and tail a log file. It's ridiculous. And they're always trying to upsell you. On top of all of that, they don't even match Linode in performance. Linode is faster. They got 11 data centers online to choose from today. They're bringing on another dozen this year. They got fantastic features like S3 compatible object storage, easy to understand backups, Kubernetes support, proactive support. I got an email the other day. There was an error in one of my backups. They traced it to a hardware problem and they automatically fixed it and resolved it. And I got a second email before I even knew there was a problem telling me everything had been just totally taken care of. That's what I love about Linode. They keep the business online. It could be a personal site. It can be your business site. They keep it online. It runs fast. So go build something. Go learn something. See why we love it and try it for yourself. Linode's what we use to build everything since we've gone independent. I know you're going to like it. Linode.com slash LAN. Get the $100 in 60-day credit and kick the tires for yourself. That's Linode.com slash L-A-N. And thanks to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. 
Collide can help Okta users achieve 100% fleet compliance. If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log into your cloud applications until they fix the problem. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. It's that simple. And Collide's solution, well, it ensures device compliance as part of authentication, which both reduces support tickets and IT frustration, while also ensuring 100% compliance. Learn more or book a demo at collide.com slash LAN. A group of open source bodies have sent a letter to voice concerns over the EU's pending Cyber Resilience Act. This group says it could have a chilling effect on open source software development. First unveiled in draft form back in September, the Cyber Resilience Act proposes a regulation on cybersecurity requirements for internet-connected hardware and software to make them more secure against cyber attacks. Really, the Act wants to solve two big issues. Internet-connected products often have weak security, and users may not know enough to choose and use them safely. Yeah, and I think those high-level goals are good ones. It reminds me of sort of like the quality of electrical equipment certification we have here in the States. As a consumer, you know, you can check the proverbial side of the box and you'd know how secure the product is. It's a neat dream. Or it could be a nightmare because there are penalties for noncompliance, which include fines up to 15 million euros or 2.5% of the global profit of the application or product. You can imagine when you're trying to implement this, the devil lies in the details, especially when it comes to how it impacts free software. And turning this dream into reality means a lot of input. 13 different organizations, including the Eclipse Foundation, the Linux Foundation Europe, and the Open Source Initiative, have written in, noting that the Cyber Resilience Act, quote, poses an unnecessary economic and technological risk to the EU. They go on to say, quote, Our voices and expertise should be heard and have an opportunity to inform public authorities' decisions. If the CRA is, in fact, implemented as written, it will have a chilling effect on open-source software development as a global endeavor, with the net effect of undermining the EU's own expressed goals for innovation, digital sovereignty, and future prosperity. Yeah, it it, it seems the aim of this letter from these these 13 different open-source groups isn't necessarily to stop the CRA but to just try to get a bigger say in the evolution of the CRA as it kind of works its way through European Parliament. The draft legislation does go some way towards addressing some of the group's concerns. Quote, In order not to hamper innovation or research, free and open-source software developed or supplied outside the course of a commercial activity should not be covered by this regulation. End quote. But... There's a catch. Trying to define what is meant by non-commercial is not necessarily a straightforward endeavor. No. In fact, a lesson we just learned just a couple of weeks ago with the conversation around Docker Hub plan changes. GitHub policy director Mike Linksveyer noted in a blog post last month that developers, quote, create and maintain open source in a variety of paid and unpaid contexts, which may include corporate, government, nonprofit, academic, and Let's be frank, a lot more. And while the regulations and rules created by the CRA are local to the EU, there's so much free and open source software created in that area, I have no doubt it would have worldwide ramifications if passed. This just seems like one of those huge jobs. When you think about the independent library developer that's just posting something on GitHub that gets slurped into some larger project, uh, just The more I think about it, the trickier this seems to pull off in the, I mean, in at least in any kind of real usable sense. It also feels sort of strange just watching this go down from afar, knowing that this could impact the course of free software. And there's really nothing we can do over here. Of course, we'll keep an eye on it and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So don't miss a single episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get every single episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch.
And if you're in the Pacific Northwest area, join us in downtown Olympia, Saturday, April 29th at 1 p.m. We'll have a meetup. Details at meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. It's going to be a good time. And as for us here on Linux Action News, well, don't worry. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. That's all the news for this week.